welcome to the Wellness Hub Podcast, a show dedicated to uncovering the future of healthy living. Each week, we aim to bring you content that supports your personal health journey through insightful conversations with amazing guests. We explore various topics ranging from healthy eating, technology, fitness, mindfulness, and more. Now let's join our host, Drew Mumro, co-founder and CEO of Up Meals, a Vancouver-based food tech startup on a mission to make healthy meals accessible through technology. Hello and welcome to the Wellness Hub. Thank you so much for joining us for yet another edition of Wellness Wednesdays. Every week, we're hosting amazing guests having insightful conversations into food, technology, mindfulness, entrepreneurship, and more. And as always, we hope you find these conversations valuable and insightful on your own wellness journey. Our special guest tonight has one of the most diverse resumes a chef could possibly have. Tonight, we'll be talking about the ever-changing dynamic of technology and food, entrepreneurship, ghost kitchens, how talented chefs are innovating during the pandemic, and much more. And a reminder, as we discuss these important topics, please comment with your questions on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, wherever you're watching. We will be answering audience questions throughout the show. Our guests' previous workplaces have included cooking in Antarctica, the Haida Gwaii, and serving fine dining food while suspended 150 feet in the air. He's one of Vancouver's pioneers of the ghost kitchen model, the founder of Vancouver Private Dining, and a true food innovator and entrepreneur. Please welcome our guest this evening, talented chef and my friend, Evan Elman. Evan, welcome to the Wellness Hub. What's going on, everybody? Wow. that. Uh... That was serious. That was a <laughs> we're, like a we're, That was amazing. We're, we're a serious production here, Chef. Serious production. I got to step up our game. Hey, you you yeah. are involved in such a variety of culinary endeavors. Every time I turn around, you're starting something new. You're such a passionate guy. I, I want to start kind of right at the beginning. Do you remember when you first started to just truly love food and see it as something more than just you know something that fuels your body? Yeah, I mean, I uh, when I was younger in my teens, um, I mean, I grew up with people cooking around me all the time, just like so. A lot of that just with tons of people around, drinking lots of wine, eating tons of different food, and everybody commenting on the food, their own opinions, and that sort of thing. So, just learning how to critique food earlier in my life, and then I don't know, I got like into food. Food network like when i was in like you know 12 and then i jumped into kitchens when i was 13 um and so i think that that's where my appreciation for food really started but it wasn't until much later in my career that um i got out of the line cook mindset if you will um, and you know, you sort of had like, that's an interesting for me to hear because you, you sort of had, I guess I'll call it like a non-traditional pathway into this, this world. I mean, from what I understand, you, you went to UBC, you got a bachelor of arts in history and film studies. So like, where, where did that come from? And like, did you ever consider pursuing that further or were you sort of just laser focused on following your passion once you finished that? God, these are great questions. Um, okay. So just to, I'll, I'll sort of give the abridged version here. Um, I started cooking when I was 13. I'm from Boston originally. Uh, I grew up cooking in different restaurants around the Cape. I never really took it that seriously. Uh, it was sort of just a way to make money in the summer, but the gift I'm winding up in were, uh, you know, pretty high octane. And so mm -hmm. I'd like wind up in these kitchens where I didn't really want that much responsibility. But I'd wind up there, and so these these skills of being organized and proper knife skills and like learning how to cook things properly, it sort of became ingrained in me from a very very young age. And I did that all the way up till I was eighteen. Um, and then UBC, um, I got a scholarship to UBC, and so uh, because I was a dual citizen, I got a citizenship when I was like ten. Um, and <laughs> sorry, just a little side story. I got a citizenship because after 9-11, my dad, who had initially been drafted to Vietnam, was not, they were going to send another draft 
and that it might happen to me. So that's why they got me the citizenship. And, you know, we were looking at schools around the United States and they were extremely expensive. And my parents gave me an ultimatum that if I went to school in Canada, which was a fraction of the price of an in-state school, like UMass, for instance, that they'll pay for my tuition. So I went with that option. And then I moved out to Vancouver when I was 18 and I didn't know anybody. And, um, you know, just the entire time being a young cook, like in my teens, I had this mentality, which isn't, which is a bit toxic, but that like, oh, like I'm better than kitchens. Like I'm not going to work here. I'd see like these, you know, quite old guys, like cleaning out deep fryers and like complaining about their families and their kids and stuff like that. And I was like, oh man, like I never want to be doing that. And and so that was sort of the mentality I went into school with. By the time I was probably 20, I needed to find a side job. And so I started working in kitchens again, Vancouver. I think my first job was like Trattoria. Um, I think I worked at like uh, some other pizza places and just like, you know, like part-time jobs and doing that sort of thing. And then by the time I graduated school uh, with a degree with a bachelor of arts um i tried to work in academia um and i wasn't really that interested in it anymore i had just been studying for five years and like i don't know it just wasn't I, I wasn't passionate about it so i decided to get back into cooking and actually take it seriously this time around and that that's kind of where the began i would say so, and one of the things that's that's interesting, and I'm sensing this now, having heard this about like earlier in your career, where you suddenly like you found yourself in these crazy situations in these super high octane, as you said, professional kitchens from a young age, even yeah. without it, intending to end up there. And now looking at some of like the the next steps in your career, like you you've had these opportunities come across your plate as sort of what you would i guess call a, a late bloomer if you will like you've cooked in some of the oh, most yeah. interesting locations like like ever like on planet earth like from a cruise yeah. ship in antarctica to on the Haida Gwaii to like suspended <laughs> from a cable like above the city oh, yeah. you know so like how how does does that how did these opportunities come to you and and what what's your approach to going for it and taking these opportunities and letting them influence you. Mm, man. So talk about insightful conversations. Holy smokes, man. You have great we're just, questions. Uh, we're diving deep, man. You knew it. You knew I what you signed it. up for. I love it. Yeah. I know. I love this. This is fantastic. Um, okay. So in general, I would just say good orderly direction, which is um, uh, a reference from a book called The Artist's Way. I've always tried to be completely open to new opportunities and just open to new people because all these different doors that open for you in your life, you have the opportunity to take, not take advantage, but open up your hand of cards. And my hand is, my hand of cards is huge right now. I have so many people that are friends and that I am generous with, with my time and my resources and all of that sort of stuff that I have all these people around me and, and, and we're, we're all tight. And these opportunities come from those people or a friend of those, that person. So for instance, the Antarctica gig, my friend, Jesse Uchida's mom posted on Facebook, any chefs that I know want to go to Antarctica? And then I immediately messaged her, you know, and, and, and then literally within 48 hours, I had signed a contract to go to Antarctica. I was wow. working at Wildtail at the time. And I went up to Eric Heck and I'm like, man, I just got an insane <laughs> opportunity. And, uh, and yeah. And so I, uh, and I did, and I did that. Um, and, you know, I think that um, like the pay for me at the time was like, whoa, like this is so much money. It wasn't actually that much money. I, it was like the first time I had, you know, when you're younger, the first time you get like an adult salary, 
You think it's just like the craziest thing it's ever? It's the greatest but day was, of your life. Yes, especially exactly. people growing up working in restaurants like you and me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I remember exactly. that day for me too. And so, and so I was getting paid like two hundred dollars a day, and I thought that that was the craziest thing I had ever heard. And so, but I was working like sixteen hours a day. I shit you not. Like, like oh, I work sixteen hours a day, like nonstop. We were working 16 hours a day, like breakfast, lunch, dinner. There was three cooks on board and one pastry chef to serve a hundred and absolutely insane. Um, but, and then also on top of that, 10 meter seas, boat going up and down. Like it was just absolutely crazy. But having that on your resume makes you look like, a very interesting person. And so if I had not taken that opportunity, I don't know if I would have gotten dinner in the sky. I don't know if I, you know, would have been able to even get into Hawksworth after I came back. So just yeah. taking these opportunities and knowing that the experience far outweighs the pay, especially in the beginning of your career is like, uh, it's, it's just a principle, you know? And I feel like I'm like Gary V or something trying to give advice, but like, seriously, it's, it's, you Getting could be the, the Gary Vee of cooking right now. I feel like that's that's what's happening. I mean, but <laughs> but you're you're right. You're right in the sense that when you're early on, you 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 check your ego at the door. You're you're yes. a young chef. You need to be open, like us, and and learning. And that's true of any career. Absolutely. And you you having that mentality, I believe, my opinion, is what's opened you up to all of these amazing opportunities. And so you're right. Like let's let's move into you know, dinner, dinner in the sky. Like you said, that Antarctica gig probably opened that door up. So for our listeners who are watching, yeah. you, you were the executive chef of dinner in the sky. Maybe just for those that don't know or not in Vancouver, what, what is dinner in the sky? Oh man. Dinner in the sky is a uh, concept that was created in. Oh, is it Switzerland, Denmark, Somewhere okay. in that region, um, in one of the Nordic countries. And so it is a platform that has 22 seats on it and a chef stays up. Oh, I think, uh, I think my, my partner is burning the chicken nuggets for our kid. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's, it, this is, this is the uh, real chef life, uh, for those listeners yeah, no, watching. This is, it's a live yeah, show, exactly. real chicken nuggets yeah. being burned right now. No, all, all good. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so platform in the sky goes onto a crane up 150 feet in the air and a chef cooks in the center there there's a bartender on each end there's two sorry two chefs in the center one safety officer two bartenders on either end and you just go up there and have a party and it is absolutely epic and did that experience, like, how long did you do that for? Like, you were going up and down on this platform serving people, what, every day or multiple times a day? Like, oh, what was the work man. dynamic like? When, for Dinner in the Sky round two, which was 2018, after um, West Coast Sightseeing acquired the company, we were going up at 1.7 times a day. Holy moly. It and that was you was. leading that show, leading seven different services on, on, on a oh, day. Yeah. I mean, oh man! Yeah, but it was also, man, but it was like we had so many. St everybody was just like, like we had, everybody was just so on point. We were working out of a trailer, so we had a um, like a semi truck trailer size trailer that could just hook onto the back of a flatbed and go away. Um, We had one of those equipped with a full line, including a tilt skillet, um, a double decker convection oven, full burners, two 40 pound deep fryers, a steam oven on one end. Other end was all prep. And then at the back was a giant um, walk-in fridge. Other trailer was one giant dishwasher half half of it and then the other side was prep and then there was like a couple of standing freezers and then like a staff slash office area to do orders it was 
So everything so was run at a trailer. Wild. So you're you're yes. you're so you're 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 prepping, you're preparing all the foods, you're loading it up, and then you are basically going up. And from that point, like once you're in the sky, it's basically a catering event. Like basically, you need to yes. have all your your mies and everything on in place. So you know that oh. that's kind. Of, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh yeah, I forgot one more thing. We installed a rationale inside of the lift up there. Wow. So we would bring up all of our mies. We would like, we would like reverse sear them and then reheat them until they're done in the rationale and then rest up there and like slice for instance. It was insane. And, and I mean, we, we just, obviously people are loving these photos. We, we just had a question from Instagram. What, what is the status yeah. of dinner in the sky? Are people able to still book with this concept? I know it's obviously, you know, COVID dependent, but is there a plan to relaunch this at some point? I believe there will be a plan to relaunch this in the future. Um, but as of now, I pulled the whole thing, unfortunately. So, yeah. Uh, we just weren't okay. able to do but, it last But the summer. concept still and, exists. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they West Coast Sightseeing, as far as I know, still owns the rights for all of Canada. So okay. um, the initial was to take the cross the country. Okay. Okay, great. Well, that, that was a great question. Thank you uh, from, from Instagram. So that's sort of a nice seg now talking about that sort of almost catering mentality. So how did that mm -hmm. opportunity bring you now into your own baby, your own business, which is Vancouver Private Dining? Tell me a little bit about how that happened. Yeah. Um, so I was on a lift one day, like doing a service at night and somebody approached me and they said, Hey, uh, you know, I got my 40th birthday coming up. Do you mind? Like, are you able to just come to my house and cook for me? I was like, uh, yeah, sure. Why not? So that was my first event ever. And then I said, Hey, you know, after I got finished with dinner in the sky, I didn't really have a job or no, sorry. I, I started working at the Wedgwood hotel. And, um, and during that time I was just working days and then at night I would build my website. And I would, you know, figure out my branding for chefevanelman.com. And this was going to be like my, my baby. And so, and, you know, we actually, we got quite busy with chefevanelman.com, the initial one. And then it started to become, uh, you know, two bookings on the same night, three bookings on the same night. And I'd hire somebody else or one of my other guys, Trevor Pavel, who's been with me since Dinner in the Sky. And he still works at Vancouver Private Dining. He's awesome. Um, you know, we just didn't have an, enough hands and they'd say, well, this is chef Evan Elman.com. Like where's chef Evan Elman? And I said, and this is, you told me this a long time ago. We had this discussion about, about don't like, put your you know, name on the sign. Yes. Who, exactly. who would be foolish enough to do that? Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, yeah, man. So we're, uh, so I started dealing with that. And so then I decided to, I actually got approached by an old friend of mine who runs a fantastic company called sweeter and they're a design agency um she um and her partner uh wanted me to be their pilot client so they designed a website and my logos and everything for vancouver private dining as their pilot client and again this is just one another one of those situations another one of those scenarios like i could have never paid for all of that work and but you know just like i don't know being uh gracious and grateful to the people around you and um abundant with your resources and time um they did that for me and it, i'm forever grateful um so yeah they website for me and then vancouver private dining was born in january 2019 i believe and, you know, we're showing as you're talking and telling this amazing story, we're showing all these these beautiful pictures of your dishes, your creations, these experiences. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what uh, what kinds of experiences are you now at this stage? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, let, let's assume, you know, before COVID happened and, and we're going to mm -hmm. talk about that in a bit. But what sorts of experiences are you, are you creating for your clients now from that initial mm -hmm. four person dinner party? Uh, um, wow. Yeah, I mean... It's, I, I think at one point my goal was just to continue to try and push boundaries and just like, you know, try and do these wild 
dishes that I don't know were almost like modern gastronomy and like I don't know trying to emulate incredible chefs but then at one point I just said to myself you know I don't think that people actually want this I think that people just want really good delicious tasting food that is a bit refined and that they can actually understand um because you know if somebody wants like an experience from a certain chef then they'll just go to that restaurant so and in a way we don't necessarily need to like appeal to the masses because a lot of our menus are customized for our clients um but it needs to be it needs to be a really impressive menu so with that um it's just a lot of research that we do on the back end and just like constantly trying to um innovate not to do necessarily the next thing but just to refine and to refine and like the flavors and like the technique all that sort of stuff like seriously technical cooking um for instance you know how can we make like i i think this initial question with like the dry aging of the fish for instance started with how can we um make sable fish taste even better or how can we make albacore tuna taste even better um and so, you know, with inspiration from um, uh, from Josh Nyland, who uh, does dry aging of fish in Australia, um, and also asking some other people on the internet and stuff like that, we figured out how to dry age fish in our kitchen. Um, and so now we have a program where we bring in fresh fish and we do a technique called suki biki, which is taking off the scales um, of the fish and just leaving the skin on. So that moisture can evaporate from the flesh itself and it condenses the flavor and um, the proteins and enzymes begin to break down in the flesh and creates a more tender piece of meat. Um, so yeah, like we are always trying to innovate and just try and push our um, talent further because like I think that that's really what cooking is about is um like a lifelong journey of learning um yeah and i mean even at you know the a lot of the guys that we hire like warren for instance is like at an executive chef level and we're constantly learning together and that is awesome there's no ego it's just a great place to work honestly and, and yeah. you hit the you hit the nail on the head. One thing I've always loved about you and and the the way that you approach business and and cooking is is you, you truly have removed the ego from this equation, and that's the the key to success. And that's difficult for a lot of talented chefs to do is that you've made it about the ingredients. You've made it about yes. learning. You've made it about the other people that work for you, and that's so rare. And I think that's mm -hmm. why you're continuing to find all these amazing opportunities. And and you know coming towards like switching lanes a little bit when you talk about truly. An, an egoless uh, company and, and a work environment. I, I want to talk a little bit about ghost kitchens, where you know <laughs> you you are silent and behind the scenes and a ghost, and you're executing something. And, and before we go into sort of the exciting company that you've launched with your with a co-founder, what tell our listeners what is a ghost kitchen and why is it important? Right. So ghost kitchens are um, a restaurant that operates without a dining room so um they can be from many different places it can be from a kitchen that does have a dining room that doesn't serve that food it can be from a commissary kitchen it can be from a food truck um ghost kitchens are interesting because they are obviously as the majority of you know um very accessible because now everybody is ordering through the apps mostly because of COVID, but also because it's easy. Um, and, you know, I still want to support local restaurants, but the reality of the situation is that a lot of people have kids and they don't have time to go pick up a pizza. They would much rather just get it delivered. And now that you can get delivery from restaurants that wouldn't usually do delivery, um, it's, uh, it's, it's really nice for a lot of people. Um, yeah. 
and and I mean, you were you were one of the earliest pioneers of this, at least here in Vancouver. This is now mm -hmm. exploding. I mean, I'm yeah. seeing these concepts take off and expand across the United States, across mm -hmm. Canada. Mm -hmm. You were you were one of the earliest pioneers here with you and and a, and a good friend of yours, uh, Chef Tushar. Tell me about the the exciting brand that you guys launched in in this format and, and what they're up to. Okay, so initially, we. He has a company called Indian Pantry. I have Vancouver Private Dining. We needed to share a space, and we also wanted to figure out a way to make a bit of extra revenue on the side. So we figured that we'd open up a ghost kitchen in the space because we said, hey, you know, we're going to be there prepping all the time anyways. Like, And so we tried to figure out what would be the easiest um, and um, the least time-consuming concept to operate. Um, and so we figured that curries would be really easy. And so, you know, we slowly started doing urban tarka, which, uh, tarka is like the act of sauteing spices in oil, uh, to release their fragrance. And so, you know, we had a North, so it, it's from Edwahi cuisine, which is like a Northern Indian cuisine that has a lot of, um, influence from, um, Persian food when, uh, Persia came to India. So a lot of like, there's a lot of saffron and black cardamom and uh, black pepper and tons of spices, cloves and nutmeg. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really delicious. And we import all of our own spices from India, toast them and then grind them all in house. So that was sort of the initial idea. <laughs> what actually happened is that we launched Urban Tarka on March 7th, I want to say March 7th or like 20, March 14th, 20, 20, something yeah, like that. Exactly. 2020. And then COVID happened like a week later. So, <laughs> so what meant is that all of the revenue from Indian pantry and all the revenue from Vancouver got, private dining were more or less gone overnight. So we needed to focus on this ghost kitchen. So, and the ghost kitchen wasn't enough. So we decided to go into retail. And I am forever thankful for Urban Tarka because going into retail was a fantastic decision. And it's a completely different world that I knew nothing about. Um, yeah. And so these, this, this concept, I mean, it, it, was, it was born out of a great idea of a sense of collaboration. And then mm. it, it was almost a, a almost a, a pivot, but a blessing in disguise because of this terrible mm. situation. You, like myself, like so many other chefs around the world, are yeah. you know just immensely impacted by by the COVID pandemic. And, and you guys were able to do a really creative and unique pivot with these amazing curries that you make. And I've I've mm -hmm. personally tasted them; they're exceptional. Where where people that are watching here in Vancouver, where could they go to to order these urban uh, these urban taco products from you? So right now we're on Legends Hall, we're on Spud.ca, and we're on Fresh Prep. Um, we're also in the Be Fresh stores, and we are in um, God, what's it called? Uh, East West Market. We are in um, Fresh Street Market. We're in. I'm trying, I'm trying, I have one in my mind that I can't remember the name of. Anyways, we're in a bunch of local grocery stores in BC um, and hopefully we'll be in some major retailers soon. Um, we're currently working with Legends Hall as our distributor and um, for their new venture. So yeah, we're really excited about that. And again, like it's just a whole different world. It's It, it has nothing to do with the chef world that I sort of grew up in, um, but it's fun to sort of, step into this entrepreneur role and learn how to expand a product. And like, I'm just learning so much. And that's, that's the exciting thing. That's what keeps me going here. Just, uh, yeah. and, and with someone like yourself, I mean, you have this very open mentality. You're open to learning, open to challenges, mm -hmm. open to new things. But mm -hmm. you know, there's with starting businesses and starting your own projects, there's always this element of risk taking. And that's what actually right. stops a lot of people before they even get to that level that you're at. So how do you manage the nerves that come with starting a new venture? Like, how do you keep it all in check? Mm. That's a good question. How do I manage the nerves? Um, I mean, I think that I have like an unfounded amount of confidence um, and not like blind confidence, but 
I am like a fake it till you make it kind of confidence. Uh, uh, that's, yeah, kind that's of. That's what I say, and I, I still yeah. say that. Exactly. Um, yeah, I would. You know, I mean, just just staying confident about the whole thing, but really, it's it's trusting myself. I don't do things that I know are going to that are when I get over my head. I know when I'm in over my head, and I won't go that far. Um, I don't ever want to be in a position where I'm underwater, and um, yeah, like that that feeling. For some people, there's a different threshold. You know, for some people, I don't know, going to the grocery store could be a lot, um, and that's totally fair. For me. It's like I got 10 projects on the go and that's like, whoa, I'm feeling a little bit like it's a little bit too much right now. And my kids screaming in the background and stuff, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't really dealing with the nerves. I don't know, man. I, uh, I don't know. I've just been working in kitchens for so long. It's like it's not really that stressful. When you look at the mm. whole situation, mm. like it's not like having a chef screaming at you or like anything like that. It's just I don't know. It's fun to me. And these, these are like, this is, a, that's an important point that you just made. And I think this is why the the hospitality world needs more chefs like you. And we're going to see a lot more chefs like you because when it's like, when you would literally rather take all of the risk and the craziness that comes with starting your own business because mm. the hospitality world of professional kitchens is so toxic, that's an issue. <laughs> <laughs> that's, like, that is a that is a big big problem when you're like oh, you know what I'm gonna start my own business because that's easier uh, sure. and, and that's something that you know I think more of us need to talk about it and, and I want to quickly yeah. jump we've got another question coming in from Instagram sure. so when you when you shifted to this retail mode totally mm -hmm. out of you know fish out of water different different world did you have a major breakthrough when you were like whoa hold on like we can we can do this oh it was you. You set me up. You set me up with a meeting with um, with Roger. Oh and gosh, really? Oh wow, meeting, I'm so oh happy. God, yeah. And then Roger was able to sort of hold our hand through that entire process. And then uh, the big breakthrough, the big one though for us was getting in with Fresh Prep. They called mm. us and they're like, "Hey, like, you know, we see your uh, retail products and your curries, and we'd like to add them to." to our lineup of products that customers can get when they check out. They're like, yeah, that should, sounds great. And they're like, okay, like we're going to start by ordering 10 cases of each SKU. I'm like, oh, wow. And they're like, per week. And we're like, what? Are you serious? And so then we actually got to really use our production kitchen uh, at our go. commissary. So that was pretty cool. So when that happened, we said, holy smokes, like there's money in this. There's opportunity to expand. The margins are razor thin, but if you do it right, um, you know, and you have the right ingredients and you don't shortcut too much and you still make a fantastic product, eh, you're going to kill it. So, mm. yeah. And I mean, our competition isn't too thick out here. Um, we have a couple people that we're competing against, but I don't know. I feel like our product is quite superior. And um, yeah, again, we're, we're, um, we haven't even really gotten to the tip of the iceberg yet we uh there's a lot there's a long way to go and we have massive plans uh and and i can't wait you guys are are dynamic and exciting and innovating and and, and most importantly extraordinarily talented you do exceptional work and, and i hope everybody goes out and clicks on that link and, and tries your product um, thank you you know and and ch changing lanes here speaking speaking creativity uh mm. as you know evan we're we're putting on we're trying to put on a, a world-class program here our our mm. crack research team we've done <laughs> and a little deep diving. We found some. We found wow. some interesting uh, tidbits about your history, uh, oh, and we have it on. We have it on uh, good authority here that you have some formative experiences. I'd like you to maybe expand upon that. Sure. Uh, one of your formative creative experiences. Uh, I'm hearing that you performed the rock and roll song "Mary Lou" in front of a crowd of 500 people at age five. I don't think that was the song that you were performing. I'd love, I'd, lo I'd love, I'd love to learn more about your uh, your your age five performance of this song, which which yeah. formed your creative and your confidence, perhaps. Yeah, I mean that definitely could be for sure. I um, I mean my father is an artist. So my entire life, I've been surrounded by artists. Um, uh, I spent a lot of time in Provincetown in Cape Cod, which is like an artist colony. 
Um, and so, and I grew up going to galleries. And so my entire life, like seeing everything through the eye of an artist has been a part of me. And then um, when I was, I, I grew up in Boston. Like I, I was born in East Boston and I moved to the suburbs for a bit. And when I came back into the city, I went to high school um, in a super inner city school. And that's when my love for hip hop music um, really came like full throttle. And so, and yeah, and so I started like writing lyrics and like me and my friends would like, I don't know, like smoke blunts and freestyle and stuff after school. And that's like what we did pretty much every day. It was great. Um, and then I started recording music and yeah. And then when I came out here, I would do like open mics at like Kerner's, uh, which is like a bar at UBC and, you know, and I enjoyed making hip hop music. And then at one point I decided to cut an album and it was well received. And I started booking shows at like fortune sound club. And we would like sell out Fortune Sound Club. And so this is my group called the People Northwest. I don't really do this anymore, just for the record. But um, we're going to throw to it anyways, because okay. I think it's super cool. And yes. I, 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 I mean, this is a part of who you are. And, yeah. and you know, I, I loved reading and discovering this. I mean, you yeah. and I who have worked professionally together, yeah. I, I never knew about most of this. Yeah. And it's amazing. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, we have uh, gone on tour with Ghostface Killa. Um, we have opened up for a number of extremely famous acts, including E40, uh, uh, Kid Ink. Um, that's that's like nobody. There's there's been so many people. I'm just like not remembering off the top of my head right now. But um, yeah, and it was awesome. And then. It was so fun. So, so we would like do these shows with people and like pack the crowds and, um, and yeah, we were like making different albums and stuff. And it sort of, it, it just stopped a bit because I had a kid and it was consuming a lot of my time and it wasn't making any money, even though it was really fun. Um, and I decided to, uh, take cooking more seriously and investing in my business more so, uh, because I, I just thought it would be more lucrative because I mean, I didn't have a ton of money when I had my daughter. So it was important to me to make sure that she was well taken care of. So I just had to make that executive decision. <laughs> but and, it's, and, it's and, a, and a very important one. Yeah. yeah. It's still an amazing you, outlet and, for me creatively, for sure. And, and, you know, talking about outlets and, and, you know, sort of unwinding and, and mental well-being. Mental health mm. obviously is a is a hot button topic. It's on the forefront of every debate. We're all talking about it now with yeah. what's happened in the past year. I mean, for you, you're a father, you're an entrepreneur, you've got multiple gigs on the go, always something. How how do you find time to unwind? What is your favorite form of self-care? And, and maybe what advice would you have for our listeners who are wondering, how can I find time to do this myself? Um, I have a few systems that I live by. Um, I write everything down, every idea that I have, and I organize it meticulously. Almost, I'd say probably three quarters of the thoughts that come to my head, I write them down. I have them all meticulously organized in my phone. Um, I do that because, um, and this also probably ties back into your last question about like, how do I handle the nerves and all that? My positions aren't, don't give me constant anxiety because I already have a wealth of resources that I've set up for myself. So instead of like each task seeming like a mountain, like creating a company, creating a brand new company, I write little things down to be able to help me out later. Um, and I line up my tasks for every single day and I'm very organized in that sense. Um, and so it makes it so that, that all the work that all the different companies I'm taking on right now don't seem too nerve wracking. So that's number one. Number two is I meditate every single day. Mm -hmm. um, end of the day, I do like a relaxing meditation to kind of just unwind and like, 
unhinge my mind because I noticed that when I don't do that at the end of the day, my mind's still racing, thinking about the things that I'm going to do tomorrow. And that keeps me up. And if I don't get enough sleep, then I can't perform at my best. Um, that's number two. Number three is I try to exercise regularly. Um, and I have like a personal trainer that I go to twice a week. And I also do, um, I also do running like on the off days. Um, and then just spending time with the things that make your heart feel full because your well of creativity will be endless if you are full of gratitude and you're happy with the things around you. Um, so, I mean, for me, that's my family and cooking good food and sharing wine with friends. That's what makes me happy. And I've also chosen to do that as my career. So I uh, need to make sure when you monetize your hobbies like that, that um, you can still appreciate them at the end of the day, because that's super important. I, yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, I want to, I want to ask you sort of one last question from my end before we take some audience questions here. And I think it's, it's a really important one that we've touched on before as someone who's grown up just like I have in the hospitality mm -hmm. and the food service industry, what mm -hmm. in your opinion needs to change about that industry when it opens up again? This is a big one. Oh man, what needs to change? At the end of the day, what needs to change is that diners need to pay more. I think that's the easiest way to answer this question. Um, if diners pay more, then sh cooks can be paid more and servers can be paid more. And you won't be having to work 12 to 16 hour shifts, busting your ass for minimum wage or less than. Um, I think that the industry just needs to not be taken for granted as it always has. And that's a massive shift in mindset for the consumer, not for <laughs> like, I think that everybody in the service industry is ready for that. Um, yeah. Um, a lot of people see the glory in the line, um, and working, you know, mastering those stations and getting to CDP, getting to sous chef, getting to, you know, um, chef de cuisine, then finally taking that exec chef role. But in a lot of ways, even though, you know, that is the role that, or that's the path that I have taken for the majority of restaurants that I've worked at, um, you, the grass is greener on the other side. You're not gonna necessarily get to that point and be stand, standing on Mount Everest. Um, I think what needs to change in the industry is that people need to get paid more. Uh, people need to have a better work-life balance and that the diners need to pay more. And th this is a massive topic that could have its own show. Um, but on, uh, oh my God, what the hell is that new app called? Uh, talk party, house party, house? Clubhouse. Clubhouse. I Clubhouse. think is what you're referring to. Yeah. Are you on yes, Clubhouse? Clubhouse. Uh, this I could have its own. Place. This could have its own room. We should start one, actually. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, but you're you're well, right, and and I, I don't think we need to have all the answers now, but we need to start having the conversations now because this this is you're right. It's a massive <laughs> massive global problem, and there isn't one answer, but there are a lot of things that can start happening now, and that's why I wanted your yes. take because your opinion is, is 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 important, and you're someone who's come from that and been so discouraged by that that you actually went and started your, your own entity to try to create your own resounding to yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but just to, to note on that at, on Clubhouse, um, Dalla from Super Baba and Leah, who's also uh, his partner at Super Baba, uh, as well as uh, Doug Steven from DL, they host this this chat um, every I want to say like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, maybe where it's like the BC. Oh, I'm blanking on the name of it right now, um, like BC Restaurant Group or something like that, and they mm, they chat mm. about w the changes that need to be made in the industry. Mm. So if you're on Clubhouse, you should go check that out because it's a really fun conversation. Awesome, I, I will, and and thank you for the suggestion. We're gonna take a, a couple of audience questions here. We've got one Please. coming in here from 
from Instagram. Uh, so in your opinion, what are the transferable skills between rapping and cooking? I actually have this question too. This might've come from me. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, like, I don't think there's direct skills. I think that um, all in all, that both are a form of expression and both are a form of artistic creativity. So I think that, you know, like whatever my um, medium is, it just, the canvas changes. Um, and so just using them both as an outlet for creativity is, I guess, what's transferable. But I, mm -hmm. I don't really know. I don't really, I'm not Action Bronson. I have no idea. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, and, and you must get, I'm sure you get this question a ton. You're a chef and lots of people want your opinion. Top three mm. restaurants or dishes in, in the city. Where are your go-tos? I love the McKenzie Room. I'm a huge fan. Um, Sean Reeve is a fantastic chef. And I want to say he's underrated because he's not. But, like, I think that more attention needs to be paid to him. His food is fantastic. Um, let's see. Other restaurants. I really like Published a lot. Um, let's see. Um, and then I think of another one. I don't know. I go to like honestly, dude. I go to like DL. We do like pizza. Nothing <laughs> wrong with that. Oh, actually, no. Holy smokes! Potluck is so good. Potluck, Potluck. is probably Potluck is top three, without a doubt. And Justin is one of the most underrated chefs in the city. His food is phenomenal. Like talk mm. about flavor. Mm. Oh my God. It's so good. He mm. does like an incredible mix of like, um, all different types of Southeast Asian cuisines on his menu. Um, and his family is from, I want to say Singapore. Um, yeah, it's, he makes incredible food. Absolutely stunning. Awesome. And th mm. we'll, we'll be posting those, uh, those links live after the show here. So if anyone wants yeah, to nice. check those out, and uh, another, we've got some fans out here on the Insta world. Uh, we hear you're in a custom shoe business, custom kicks. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? What the hell? Somebody okay. dropped that I in the know. comments. Somebody from <laughs> went to my high school must be on here. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. I, um, when I was younger, I would paint sneakers. And so I had this almost like Jackson Pollock-esque way of painting <laughs> them. And this was in like 2006. So you got to understand that like I was way ahead of my time. Mm. I would tape out like on like a pair of Air Force Ones, for instance, I would tape out the outlines and then I would take a bunch of these. Um, I think they were actually model for like War Warhammer and like, uh, yeah, Warhammer, like which is these like models that I would paint when I was younger. You take the paint from that and then you take the brush, dip it in and then you'd like flick it like that and it would splatter all over. So like, oh man, actually I can grab one of the shoes right now. Do you want to see it? You have it? Go get it. We got, we go okay. get it. If, it, if it's there, go one get time. it. We're, we're going to, we're going to, this is, you know, I think this is, this is valuable content that the people want to see. I, I have been floored learning about all of Evan's projects. Uh, f full disclosure, Evan and I worked together. He worked for the uh, catering company that I've run here for the past decade prior to starting up meals. And I knew how dynamic and, and passionate and talented he was, but this is another level. Uh, we're going to bring Evan back here and, and see the shoe. You're, you're back. Let's see it. So I, I'm dying to know. All right. This is, there's probably one pair of these left on earth and here you go. This is it. Holy moly. Let's bring it, bring it a little closer. I just want to see it. Oh my goodness. I said, so this, like, is a, this is a hand painted custom shoe. So how you would, you would, you got it. Would, would you buy the shoes or would somebody give you the, their own shoes yeah, to pay? Exactly. So somebody would give me like a new pair of shoes because like, I don't know, like just growing up in the city, like in America, it's like, especially in like inner city culture, like if you had a pair of shoes that nobody else had, like everybody can get a pair of Air Force Ones. That's not special. But if you have a pair of Air Force Ones, that's painted like lime green and yellow with this like, you know, with this like check like that. Or like, I don't know, the Cookie Monster painted on it or something like that. That's cool. And so people would bring me a brand new pair of shoes. Um, and yeah, that's it. I mean, this, this was a game changer for me. I, I, that's, that's amazing to learn that about you. And, and you know, we have, we'll take one more question here from the audience. So regarding the sure. hospitality industry, how do you okay. make sure that all the necessary benefits reach the staff? In terms of... 
Like, yeah, I, I'm like, not sure. This is an audience it? question, but I, I, I'm assuming the benefits of, of being employed there. This is a question. I, I think, you know, largely what people don't realize, and you can back, is that there really aren't any benefits offered to a lot of line cooks and to a lot of frontline no. hospitality workers. Um, no. and, and that's another part of the bigger problem. Maybe you could speak to that. Sure. I don't know from your experience, but I, I never got medical benefits working in, in restaurants as a line cook. I swear to God, dude, you were the first place that actually gave me medical benefits. Really? That's heartbreaking to me. Because uh, <laughs> you were cooking for a long time in some great places yeah. before, before yeah. me. Yeah, so you were the first person, and that was amazing. Um, how do I make sure that those benefits reach the staff? I mean, typically, like, we haven't even offered benefits to our staff yet just because we're not big enough. But when that is... Um, um, but when that is available, I mean, it's going to be offered to everybody who works for more than three months for sure. Got it. So, and, and I think there's, you know, there's, there's a question here saying the idea that you have of those staff being paid more as a result of dining so that, you know, how do you make sure that the end result of those higher prices, the diners pay, make it to the people that are cooking the food? I guess that it is showing the lack oh, of trust. I think that's where they're right. coming from. Oh. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's, again, like, um, it's a mentality shift that needs to happen. And I think that if it's a widely known fact that now diners are paying more and if for any reason the staff wasn't being paid more, that is like a, that is like a, a cardinal sin. You know, I mean, I think that the idea would be that the staff gets paid more and for that reason, the diners need to pay more. But yeah, again, this and, is like and I think there's, there's a there's a transparency component there too that needs to happen that historically hasn't happened yeah. between the restaurant and the diner to justify right. those higher prices and and that that's something that needs to be worked on as well and and yeah. you know last Evan you know I, I want to ask you've shared so many great things if people want to if people want to learn more about you and your various projects where 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 should they go where should they visit. I don't know. I should start a website or something. Um, you can check out vancouverprivatedining.com. Uh, you can just check out my personal Instagram if you kind of just want to follow at Chef Evan Elman. Um, you can, you know, to like follow along in my like non-professional life, sort of professional, non-professional family is all sorts of stuff. Um, we got our new uh, concept, Frankie, uh, at Frankie YVR and also at Urban Tarka YVR. So you can follow any of those for our projects. Um, but yeah, if you follow, you're pretty sure about to see a lot of stuff if you follow me on Instagram. Amazing. Well, Evan, I, I really appreciate you joining me, taking so much time answering all these great questions and all of these audience questions. Um, you are one of the innovators and the pioneers in, in the, the new wave of talented chefs, and, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you very much for, for being Thank on the Wellness Thank you so up. much, my friend. Thank you so much, man. It was great talking to you. All right, take care. The industry needs more chefs like Evan. I think that's evident from our conversation uh, in what is often considered a vastly underpaid, overworked and underappreciated workforce in hospitality. What is being done? Who are the voices? Chefs like Evan are challenging these antiquated notions with new ideas and new empowering concepts. I think we can all agree the COVID-19 pandemic exposed how truly vulnerable the hospitality workforce is. As someone who has grown up in this industry, an industry that teaches you that the key to success is enduring the pain, the ridiculous hours, and the substandard pay that comes along with being a cook or a server or any type of hospitality worker. The question to many young people becomes, why? Why, why bother? Why enter this industry. And with fewer and fewer young people entering the hospitality workforce, the industry needs chefs like Evan breathing new life with exciting and dynamic concepts and opportunities. I think I can speak for all of us when I say I cannot wait to see what he does next. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. If you'd like to engage with us and join the discussion, please follow us on YouTube, Instagram, or LinkedIn at UpMeals. We will see you next Wednesday evening right here on the Wellness Hub for another great conversation. I'm Drew Monroe. Until then, take care and be well.